performance if you haven't come across Stephanie before she's firmly believes that high performance is not a mystery and it's not luck she's uh, got a thinks there's a whole system and process for how performance works that's what she's going to talk through today she's uh, helps challenge people to explore their leadership style and how it impacts their uh, team's culture and right now we're going to focus on three P's of high performing organizations I know Steph, Stephanie, you've got a, a whole book that's coming out on this, so I uh, can't wait to dive in. And uh, thank you for thanking you for joining us uh, from Byron Bay. Thank you, Julia, and thanks everybody who's uh, who's watching this either live right now or later on on the recording. So it's really lovely to be in your space, in your online space right now. Um, and yes, the book is actually already out, so. Um, it's called Purpose, Passion and Performance, and that is essentially what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I thought I'd set the scene a little bit with a story about kind of one of the most seminal experiences I've had, one of probably the most impactful learning experiences I've had in my journey. Um, and I'll take you right back to when I was doing my master's. I was a mature age student. There were 30 of us, and we were completing a master's of organisation dynamics at RMIT University in Melbourne. And we'd only all met literally, you know, one week prior. It was a sort of a course introduction. So 30 kind of strangers in a room together, all mature age students. And we walk into the room and there's a circle of chairs. Um, so don't forget, this is a uni course. I was expecting a lecture theatre. I, I was expecting desks and formal kind of rows. But no, all that was gone. It was just a, an open room with a circle of chairs, kind of like group therapy style. So we all tentatively walk in and take a seat and our course lecturer um, is sitting in the center of the, sitting on, it, on one of the chairs in the circle. And he starts by saying that our first task as a, as a group today is to study the group dynamic as it occurs. And the clock will be running for an hour and we will just while that hour's on be studying the group dynamic as it occurs. The uh, session was gonna be recorded and we were going to be asked to complete an assignment on a five minute segment of that session. And so pretty baffled and pretty uncomfortable at this stage, but he starts the clock and we're all sitting there in absolute silence. No one really knows what to say or what to do. And the, the clock's ticking. And in my mind, I'm thinking, should I speak? Should I not speak? What does that say about me if I speak? What does that mean? What's a group dynamic? What is this? Very uncomfortable. I literally feel like I've got sweaty hands right now just recounting the story. Um, and, um, and so on for an hour it went, I think somebody eventually did start speaking and then we started commenting on why that person spoke and why we felt the need for silence, why we felt the need for speaking. And um, it was literally the most uncomfortable experience I think I've ever had. But what that whole thing was about, it's a group relations um, Tavistock style learning experience. And what that was about was essentially unveiling that at any, at any point in any task, there are two systems at play. There's the work system or the task that you've got to perform. And there's a human system, which is how we actually interact to perform that task. And what we did that day was remove the work system. It was completely gone. The task was to study the group dynamic as it occurred. And so all of a sudden, like a, like a curtain being lifted on a stage, we were suddenly looking at what's always been behind the scenes, which was how we interact in order to get things done. And that experience really helped me understand that the human dynamic, the way humans interact, has a huge part to play on the success of how we perform a task. But yet very rarely do we look at that system, very rarely do we try and understand how do we actually elevate the human system, the way people are interacting, so that we can help them perform the task a little bit more productively and effectively? And so that experience really led me down this path of really understanding what is organisation dynamics and what drives human performance. 
And I've worked with literally hundreds of senior leaders, senior teams since then in my own practice on really trying to help them elevate their performance by working at their human system, understanding what drives human performance and elevating their potential that way. So I see myself a little bit now as a fitness coach for businesses, um, really trying to help them elevate their performance through looking at the interaction and the interplay of people and task. So in my work and time with all of these leaders, interacting with them over time, what I've discovered is there are kind of four major, major problems that they tend to come up to, to talk to me about. These are the often re, these are the reasons why people um, approach me. Um, and, and I think number one, the major issue that a lot of leaders, and I'm, you know, when I talk about leaders, I'm talking about, I'm talking mostly to CEOs of fast moving companies. I'm talking to executive teams. I'm talking to people and culture leaders of organizations. You know, usually the size about 50 to 500. So they're still at a point where they're, they're experiencing growth and they're experiencing rapid growth. But what these leaders often say is that they there's no leadership in their business. They're, they're frustrated by the fact that they've hired good people, they've given them great training, but they're not seeing leadership. They, they want their people to stand up and take accountability, to be responsible for their own teams and for their own performance. So no leadership is a big issue. The second thing I hear them talk a lot about is diluted culture. So in a fast growing business, the CEO or the person, the founder, is often the, the, the beginning of the culture. It's their values, their personality, their style that, that influences the way people work together. And as businesses grow, there's they can't get around to every single person in a business anymore. They need to start relying on their leadership team, their leaders who are also having trouble stepping up and taking leadership um, to, to communicate and emulate that culture. So the culture, is if it's growing rapidly and we're not talking about our values and how we work together enough, it starts to get diluted. We get new on new on new and the culture starts to change and shift and move away from what that CEO wanted to see. The other thing that they talk about that, really, that they really struggle with is a lack of alignment. You know, they, they start seeing silos forming. They see their leadership teams trying to be accountable for their part of the business, but they're not collaborating and communicating across the different elements of the business. And, you know, as we know, we structure organisations in departments, but we need those departments to work together. Otherwise, you know, we get this lack of alignment. We get people performing their part, but not making sure that their part connects to the other parts in order to live, deliver the product or service that we're working towards. But I think probably the main and, and, and core driver of what most leaders really struggle with that I work with are, is decision fatigue. They're just sick and tired of having to make all of the decisions. It's like everything stops with them, the buck stops with them, and they just want people around them to make more decisions, to take more ownership, to drive more outcomes, and nothing seems to get done without their say-so. And so the buck stops with them and they can't help but be control freaks. They don't want to be control freaks, but they can't help it because everybody's relying on them to make the decisions. And this is exhausting. It slows growth and um, it, it puts them in a position of um, decision fatigue. So, so what's the solution to all of this? I think essentially what leaders really want is they want a high-performance team. They want to switch from lack of leadership, lack of alignment, diluted culture, you know, decision fatigue, they want to switch from that to a team who is happy and high performing, who, who are working synergistically together, like a, a symphony orchestra, where all the different um, elements of um, the instruments beautifully intertwine and work in harmony to create beautiful music or to create the beautiful tune. And what they want to be is just the conductor, kind of swinging their, you know, keeping the rhythm for everybody, but seeing all of that work come to life um, into the, the, the ideas of what they hear. So in order to do that, how, what, is a, what is a high performing team? And I think when we talk about high performing teams, we often focus on the word performance. But I think there are three essential ingredients to high performing teams. And that's why I call them the three P's of high performing organizations. And those three things are purpose, passion, and performance. And we need to have all three because purpose without passion is just an empty cause. 
passion without purpose is kind of a bit dangerous. <laughs> and uh, per passion, uh, passion and purpose without performance is just wasted energy. So we sort of need to have all three. We need the three P's of high-performing organisations. And I'll tell you the reasons why we need all three. So purpose is a, um, it's often thought, thought about and talked about very esoterically. But essentially what purpose is, your purpose is the value that you add to, to the market. It's how you create value. It's how you share value. And organisations that are purpose-driven are really motivated to create value and drive um, purpose amongst all of their stakeholders. So they consider their customers their stakeholders. They consider their employees their stakeholders. They consider their suppliers their stakeholders, their community, even the environment, and they, as well as obviously their shareholders. Now, I think a lot of us have been brought up in a, in a world to believe that business exists to make a profit. And that is certainly one of the, one of the key things that business is, exists for. But purpose-driven organisations really understand that in order to generate a profit, we actually have to value and maintain the, the interests of all of our stakeholders. And when we do that holistically, when we actually ensure that we gain a benefit across all stakeholders, then we do generate more of a profit. And this has actually been proven in some research by a man called Raj Sasoda. So Raj Sasoda is the, um, he is the father of conscious capitalism. It's a movement dedicated to sharing the news that if we actually focus on sharing and creating value amongst all stakeholders, we ultimately do generate more profit, although that's not the reason that we do the business. So conscious capitalism is a movement that organisations can, can become members of to really start to instill this, this mindset within their own organisations. But his research was able to demonstrate that purpose-driven organisations, and he calls them firms of endearment because these are companies that literally endear themselves to their customers, to their people. Uh, people love them. You know, they literally love them. They talk about them. They talk to their friends about them. They're the companies people want to work for. So they're called firms of endearment. But he was able to demonstrate that his research that these companies actually outperformed S&P 500 companies by, by 14 times and the Jim Collins good to great companies by six times over a period of 15 years. So purpose-driven organisations actually outperform profit-driven organisations by a factor of up to 14. So it actually has a lot of value to be purpose-driven and to value and hold in mind delivering value across all stakeholder groups. So that's why we need to have purpose as a marker of high performance. The other marker of high performance is passion. So passion is a, is an, is a, is a word that describes engagement, essentially. It's, it's a, when people have passion for what they do, they care about it. You know, and that passion, that energy is felt by their colleagues and it's felt by the customer. Passion is a positive and inspiring force and it, mo it, mo it sustains momentum, mo mains, sustains momentum when things get hard because, you know, we're all moving fast. We've got busy days, busy lives, task lists as long as our arms. If we didn't have passion and energy, how would we overcome that every single day? Passion motivates us. And the way that we measure passion is engagement. And when we're talking about engagement, what we really want to look at is Gallup, the Gallup organisation and their research. So Gallup has been measuring engagement for 50 years. They've, they've tested 1.8 million people around the world. And their most recent meta-analysis, which was published in 2019, you can download the report from their website, demonstrates that, that organisations in the top quartile of engagement, so those who are in the top 25% of engagement, compared to organisations in the bottom quartile of engagement, deliver outstanding results on a whole number of measures. So people who are passionate, people who are engaged, tend to demonstrate um, better um, customer metrics, so we get 10% more customer happiness, higher productivity, better sales and profitability, and this is what I find most interesting. People who are in the top quartile engagement deliver 20% more sales and 21% more profitability than those in the bottom quartile engagement. 
They also demonstrate lower absenteeism, lower turnover, less shrinkage, less safety incidents, um, and less quality incidents. So on a whole host of measures, engagement, people who are more engaged and more passionate about their work actually drive better results. So that's why passion is a significant marker of a high performing organisation. And the third marker is obviously performance. And in high performing organisations, what's happening is we get people who are clear on how their activities drive value. So they know how what they're working at actually drives results. They're looking at results, they're measuring their performance against results, but they're clear on what they do and how they do those things and how those things drive results. So if we want the three Ps of high performance, and you know, we want to drive, if, if CEOs who I work with accept that to have a high performing team, what they need to have is purpose, passion, and performance. What they really need to think about is their, is their human system. So, you know, harking back to my story at the start about really how we perform is dependent on the human system and the work system. Yeah. So what I talk to people about is not how we can restructure your processes for doing your work. Really what we need to look at is how you actually support and harness the human system so that they can be empowered to deliver the work in the most productive and efficient way. So when I talk about systems, I'm not talking about Asana, I'm not talking about Salesforce, I'm talking about the human system. And if we think about our organisations, they are very complex systems. They have lots of interconnecting parts. We often um, represent our organisations in these hierarchical structure charts, although they're slowly starting to disappear too, but they are still a predominant way we tend to represent our organisations. And what they are, these kind of formal lines, vertical horizontal lines, defining how our roles are connected. But what they don't represent is actually how the, the complex web of interconnections that happens between all of those people every single day in the performance of the work. So what's actually happening is we, when we've got an organizational system, it's a complex web, it's an interconnected system. And if we have an interconnected system, then what we need is a process for how we support how those systems work together. What we need to support is a mindset of teaming where we might have hierarchical roles the way people are managed by certain parts or certain individuals. But really what we want are for people to be able to come together productively and team to generate the results that we're looking for across different departments, across different pillars, across geographical lines. So we want to create a, a system that has uh, clarity around how we work together and has some boundaries, but those boundaries aren't so tight that they aren't allowed to work across these different kind of, you know, hard to hierarchical structure lines. So when we think about a system, what's happening in a system is there is an input conversion and export process. Think about an organisational system. We import um, people and supplies and products and we convert those things using our value add process and we export them we export our products and our service ultimately and if we want to improve the import conversion and export process what we actually need to import are systems of performance that drive um, a Im improved value add conversion process to drive those outputs and so what I think we need to see ourselves as is system architects. So leaders are actually these system architects. They architect the systems that support this import conversion export process for the human system. And it's a little bit like playing a game of Minecraft. So I don't know if you have children. I never knew what Minecraft was, but I've got two little boys and they are obsessed with this game. But I actually, of all the video games I could play, I actually really like this one because what they do is they walk into this, um, they walk into the, the an open field, you're the player, you walk into a pretty much an open field with nothing on it, and you get to build whatever you want to build. So they've built pyramids, they've built their dream home. You know, it's 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 more extraordinary than the Kardashians home, the one that they built in Minecraft. But it's pretty awesome because they get to use their imagination. And what I think we as leaders do in organizations is 
we're not the players of the game, but we build the system where people come and play. And we create the rules for how you can play. So Minecraft is a pretty open field, but there are still a whole lot of rules around how you can build and what you can use to build. And there are, you know, challenges. There's zombies that come and destroy things. And there's, you know, pigs they have to store and all kinds of things. And what we do is we create the, the field so that our people can come and play and build the stuff that they want to build to create something really special. So I think leaders need to see themselves as architects of a system for people. And um, if we're going to follow that train of thought, then I guess the next logical question is what do we build these systems for? If we want purpose, passion and performance to have a high performing team, how do we build, you know, what are the structures we need to build to create that in our field of play? If we were to listen to Mr. Peter Drucker, he would say he's the father of modern corporate philosophy. He would say that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I agree with a lot of things that Mr. Drucker has said, but I don't agree with him on this point. And here's why. I think strategy and culture are equally important. And he's missed a third key ingredient, and that's leadership. Leadership, culture, and strategy are like the highly, the holy trinity of high-performing teams. And, you know, they're in really good company because lots of good things come in threes. We've got the three bears, the three little pigs. <laughs> We've got three-legged stools. Can't have a chair without three legs. Um, but also there's other symbols that, that point to this kind of rule of three as being very meaningful. In Kabbalah philosophy, three signifies harmony. And to the Chinese, three is a lucky number. So to create a high-performing organisation, we need uh, the three systems of high performance. Here it is. What we have is a system for high performance, and it includes three interconnected systems that fuel purpose, passion, and performance. So leaders fuel purpose by connecting people to their purpose in the organisation and the organisation's purpose in the market. And they fuel this idea that to serve uh, with purpose is to balance the needs of all stakeholder groups. We prioritise. We don't prioritise profit over people. We actually harness the collective energy of people, all people, all of the people that we work with, including those outside the organisation, to ultimately drive positive profit. So leaders drive purpose. Culture fuels passion. So if we want a, 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 a culture of highly engaged people, what we need to think about is our, is our culture. When you think about the system that we have that engages people, how we look after people at each point in their employee life cycle. And then strategy fuels performance. So strategy, our strategies outline, what are our standards of expectation? What are we actually working towards? How do we define success? What are our markers of success? Who owns what in the, in the creation and execution of strategy? And those three things, when we have leaders who drive purpose, culture drives passion, and strategy drives performance, what we have is this, this kind of spinning wheel, kind of like this fidget spinner here. So this was a this is another, you know, one of my kids' toys. They love it, but I love it too now. I'm a bit obsessed with it. It really flows. It spins like this. And it, maintain, it maintains its own momentum for ages. So what we want to do is we want to get these three systems working together and fueling each other. And what happens is as we generate more purpose, passion and performance in an organisation, the outcome of all of that is profit. Now, profit's not the reason that we do business, but it certainly is the outcome of doing business well. And it's very necessary. It's like the life-giving blood of an organisation. It keeps the whole system flowing and growing. So to generate these three uh, systems, as if we're, if we're leaders and we want to have these three pieces of high performance, what we need to do is create systems for each of these things, for leadership, for culture, and for strategy. And why do we want to have it? Why do I see these things as systems? Well, they're systems because there's a process for how you do it. There's a way of leading. There's a way of emulating and creating culture. There's a way of creating strategy. There's, there's good ways and there's less good ways. And so what I've done through my work is try and simplify those ways down those processes or those systems for each of those three things into something that's very manageable and very doable for leaders in organisations. It's kind of like a formula for how it works. 
And it's not rocket science, but really it is just about trying to embed these and then get your people doing them and learning them. And that's when leaders relieve themselves of the need, especially CEOs and founders, they relieve themselves of the need to always be, always be there making the decision. They start to empower their people to own their own results. They start to empower their people to lead, communicate effectively and know how what they do drives outcomes. And that means they free themselves up from having to be there all the time to do that for them, which then also means they can keep their minds on the market. They can think about expansion. They can think about how they create adaptability and flexibility into their organizations. And they can, they can trust that their people and their systems and their culture is going to execute um, these, these new deliverables that they are working towards growing. So let's look at each of these in a little bit more detail. If I'm talking about the fact that there's a process for leading, for culture and for strategy, and for strategy well, what are they? And um, they, are, they are very simple ways for actually um, delivering on these things. So the leadership system. When I, think, when I say leadership system, what I actually mean is that leading, leadership is a system of behaviour. So it's a perpetual process of building capability in your people and inspiring high performance in the service of an organization's purpose. So it's a system of really actually deceptively simple behavioral codes. There's been a lot written about leadership. I mean, you only have to Google leadership to see how many millions of hits there are on the word leadership. And even in Amazon, how many books have been written about leadership? And I can safely say I've read a lot of them. Um, and really what I've taken from this is that we need to make it practical. People are busy, leaders are busy. They don't have time to read lots of texts about how to lead. What they just want to know is what do I need to do with my people to make, to help them achieve high performance. So really it comes down to these three key behaviours. It all boils down to this. What leaders need to do is they set clear standards of performance and they get those standards from the strategic plan. So these are the goals and KPIs we need to hit. And they also get their stand those standards from their values and behaviours. So the values that the corporate organisation agrees to uh, withhold. That's where those standards come from. And they set those standards within their teams and they need to um, like clearly articulate what their expectations are for performance. So a lot of the issues that I see leaders face is that they're not actually articulating their vision. They're not articulating their expectations. They're not writing it down. They're not putting it in a measurable statement that people then understand clearly what they're being asked to do. Then what they also do is they normalise feedback. So they create cultures where it's safe to give and safe to receive feedback. What we actually want in cultures and in teams is for people to, to want to quickly learn. So to learn from mistakes, to grow quickly. So when we normalise a culture of feedback, what we see is that it's not personal. Really what it's about is driving performance outcomes and to help us get better and better in the way that we operate and help us be better, um, better leaders, develop our own capabilities. So when feedback is given and received in that nature, it's actually a very powerful and motivating force. And then finally, we coach strengths. So you know, leaders need to set the standard, give people feedback on where they're saying in relation to that standard or how they're performing in relation to that standard. But then ultimately, we don't just leave them hanging, we coach them. So we get in front of them and we help them understand what their strengths are and how they can put their strengths to work in achieving the standards that we're actually setting. And the intersections of this model is about the performance conversations that really tie this all together. So when they set standards they not, and normalise feedback, they're having performance conversations. When they normalise feedback and coach strengths, they're having development conversations. And when they're coaching strengths and setting standards, they're having behaviour conversations. And what leaders really need to do is adopt these as habits, leadership habits that they demonstrate every day in the service of leadership uh, of their people. And it's literally just, again, like, like a spinning wheel demonstrating these things. And that ultimately drives high performance outcomes. So that's the leadership system. Let's have a look at the culture system. Oh, gone a bit too far there. There it is. So the culture system is a process for living your values at every stage of the employee life cycle and essentially prioritizing the well-being of your staff. Richard Branson is famous for saying that to look after your, don't look after your customers, look after your employees. If you look after your employees, they will look after your customers. And sure, Mr. Branson, I will follow your advice. 
But essentially what the culture system is about, it's about saying, be clear and, and communicate uh, and create and communicate your purpose beyond profit. So how you add value to all those stakeholder groups, your values and behaviours. So how you want to behave in the pursuit of your company mission and your culture plan. So your culture plan is how you communicate the way that you live those values at every stage of the employee life cycle. And really what a, a culture system is about, it's about helping drive performance, um, performance of an organisation. But, but really it's about living those values because if we live those values, we're creating value in, in the way that we operate. And then finally, we've got the strategy system which, is, which really aims to close the gap between strategy creation and strategy execution. So the biggest challenge we have with strategy is it's 60%, it's, it's so organisations are great at building strategic plans, but the biggest challenge is the execution of the plan. So there was some research that demonstrated that um, tip, companies typically realise about 60% of their plan strategic value. So the strategy system really aims to align the whole team to work collaboratively. And it involves three things, the creation of a business, business plan that is clear and actionable. And really that business plan is a one page plan. We have to force ourselves to be succinct and to be clear. And to do that, putting it on a page means that we, we do that. We have to keep ourselves tight and clear on what we're actually asking people to do. The, biz, the one page business plan includes everything that sits within that triangle. So it articulates your purpose, it articulates your value, typically your vision, which is a one, three and 10 year statement. So it has a short, medium and long term focus. But a vision statement, you know, I'm, I'm, I love vision statements, but often again, they're esoteric and they don't articulate what good looks like at one year, three years and 10 years. So what we need to do with our vision statements is make them clearly measurable. It includes pillars, goals, and KPIs. So what are our strategic pillars that drive achievement of those of those vision, of that vision? And then it's broken down into a series of priorities. So once we've created a clear and actionable strategy, we cascade and align our teams to those KPIs and goals. And we ultimately need to evaluate and review for performance. So we create meeting rhythms and reporting rhythms that help us track how we're performing against that plan and enable us to pivot based on the changing demands in the market, the opportunities that we see pop up as we learn and go through the process. And really it's about getting better at closing the gap between strategy creation and strategy execution. So the, the high performance system really is about recognizing that leadership fuels purpose, culture fuels passion and strategy fuels performance. And together these three P's, purpose, passion and performance equal profit. And what is it that you can take away from this? Well, I think if you're a leader, if you're a business leader or a leader of teams, if you drive your own business or you're an HR person trying to create a high-performing organisation, your job really is to architect these systems of high performance. And the more integrated these systems, the better our performance becomes. We translate leaders from hostile leadership styles or directive leadership styles to far more supportive and inspiring leadership styles. We convert cultures that can be, you know, highly toxic or even just defensive, uh, where people need to use defense mechanisms to get by, all the way through to being very inclusive and adaptive. And we translate strategy from being invisible, it doesn't exist, or it's outdated, so it's not keeping up with the pace of change, to being very clear and actionable. And what we saw from, uh, what we understood from Raj Sasoda's research on purpose-driven organisations is what that can drive is exceptional market performance up to 16 times compared to S&P 500 performance. So where do you start? Essentially where you start is you think about which system you want to implement first. Do you want to work about, you want to work with your leaders? Do you want to work on culture or do you want to work on strategy? What's the thing you're challenged with the most? Is it lack of clarity? Is it lack of leadership? Or is it a diluted culture? And then start there. So start with the system. And what we need to do is embed these over time. So we, we create a bit of learning around our culture. We articulate our values. We think about how we need to live them at every 
touch point in our employees experience and then we run that through and we start to observe the impacts on the organization and then if we've worked on culture and we've started to create a little bit of a process around how we live culture we might then move to strategy and we create a bit of a process around how we articulate how we define how we execute how we continuously learn based on our results and then finally we, we then might move to how we actually develop leaders and help them understand that if you're going to lead what we're asking you to do is set clear standards of performance, give people really great feedback and ask for feedback all the time and actually focus on coaching them and developing them into these roles and these standards that we're setting for ourselves. So if you want to learn more about how to do those things, the book that I wrote, Purpose, Passion and Performance, is a how-to guide for leaders. It's really simple. Um, it's broken down into the what, what are the literal steps you can take but you can also, if you want support, you can reach out to me on the details that you have as part of BID21 conference to ask, ask for some help, ask for some questions. Um, those are the things I love doing. I love working with organisations to help them implement these systems of performance and develop their leaders to be more capable um, and to relieve themselves of the constant pressure of having to be there to make every decision for things to happen around them. So... On that, I just want to say thanks so much for your time, your effort, your energy to listen to this today. Um, Julia, do we take questions? Are we happy to take a few comments from...